Well, I'm going to get started. I hope you can hear me. I'm using a different microphone. Oh, hmm. And uh, we'll see what happens. I pray. Loving God, we ask that you open our minds and our hearts that we might learn more about you, that we might be able to enter more fully into our study of Scripture and how we might express that in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just going to set that to silent. There we go. So um, I want to start by acknowledging the irony of a white, uh, cisgendered, heterosexual uh, male who's grown up in essentially the colonial system talking about feminist theology. Um, and I'm not a feminist theologian. It's not an area I'm deeply formed in, uh, and um, I just don't know it that well. So for me, this evening was, at least partially, just getting to know it a little better. And I'm hoping it'll be a chance for you to get to know it a little better, or maybe even be introduced to it in the first instance. So I hope you have the notes, but if not, just listen along and we'll see how it goes. So I'm going to start with kind of a family tree moment. Actually, no, let's go back a step. Um, when I first started doing theology, I was under the impression that there was theology and then there was, you know, feminist theology or, or orthodox theology or evangelical theology. But I had this picture in my mind that there was kind of a basic theology that was core, if you will. And then there was deviations from that. The reality of the situation is that that's not the case. Uh, and there's, um, there's a phrase, all theology has an adjective. And what I grew up with was white European sort of ivory tower uh, academic theology. That's what I thought theology was. Uh, and fortunately for me, I had lecturers who introduced me to a whole range of other ideas, uh, which was great which was great, and feminist theology was a part of that. So historically, feminist theology is kind of grouped or categorized, and some people would say comes out of this move that is called liberation theology. So liberation theologies... Ah, apparently we're having some issues with the connection. That's irksome. Oh, well, hopefully it has a recon... Uh, you're not going to be able to tell me if it's reconnected. I'll check here. Okay. That looks like it's reconnected. Okay. So, where was I? So, the liberation theologies take seriously the present reality of things. They take seriously the, the circumstance of people now. And so, they are, in a sense, they're what most preachers try and do every week. They are an attempt to connect the ideas of Scripture to the present reality. That's what, you know, clergy try and do, preachers try and do all the time. But they do so in a very, in a far more um, systematic way. These days, I would suggest that what we now call liberation theology has as a primary area of concern uh, economic liberation. Uh, libera the, the economic uh, structures of the world. It will highlight things like, you can't just, you know, you can't just say things like, oh, other countries are third world and that's why they're poor. Econ liberation theologians will point out that they are poor because wealthy countries suppress them. Uh, so, that, so, yes. Uh, black theology tends to reference particularly uh, sort of American the black theolo theologians who take seriously the, their lived experience. Um, Post-colonial theology tends to pick up things like theology coming out of Southern Africa, uh, which is post-colonial. Uh, Aboriginal theologians 
uh, Asian theologian, theologians. Uh, and it, it picks up what it's like to be emerging from essentially a colonial past. And feminist theologians uh, pick up they pick up the the woman's experience. So so that's where they have their strong emphasis. And I want to pick, sort of get cracking with a quote by Erickson. Now Erickson has done uh, sort of a comprehensive uh, survey of theology, and you know it's it's slightly out of date now. Uh, he it was copyrighted in 1998, so it's it's a couple of years old. But I really thought for you know for a piece that was written over 20 years ago, his little comment on liberation theologies has a lot to say. In liberation theology, the unchanging and unchangeable God of traditional theism is actually an idol developed by those who have the most to lose and change. Isn't that powerful? So it, it, it's, a, you know, it's the traditional theologians are, have kind of, div, you know, th there's this picture of God that supports the status quo, and that's not God, that's an idol. Um, on the contrary, God is actively involved in change. And this means that, and now Erickson uses he, is not neutral. Since God is in favor of equality, God cannot and must not work equally for all people. I thought that was like a really cracker um, couple of phrases coming out of yeah, essentially pro predominantly Protestant white theologians, to be able to put that down. I just thought that was worth kind of going to. So, uh, yeah. Now, as I said, feminist theology comes out of that stream. Now, not all liberation theologians will agree with all other liberation theologians. <laughs> um, but there's often a kind of cohesive set of concerns, if you will. Looking at that, um, Part of the concern is a present reality concern. It's a concern for how things operate in the here and now. And so there is always a political social element to theology, to, to feminist theology, to the liberation theologies, to, you know, um, it's not, it's not about trying to jam modern concepts into ancient texts. Uh, the, the, the writers in this area are far too smart to even try and do that. In fact, they want to not do that. It is a goal of theirs to not. Rather, it's a goal to take modern questions and concerns, look to Scripture to see what that has to say in that context, and then to try and apply that understanding to create space and leverage. So this next section I, pro I basically just ripped from Wikipedia. Um, Christian feminist theologians, uh, they seek to advance uh, and understand the equality of women and men. So um, it's not about saying women are better than men or men are better than women, but rather that they are equal. Uh, socially, morally, spiritually, and in leadership from within a Christian perspective. And that leadership thing is important. Uh, I can remember a few years ago when I was working at St. Hilda's, which is a girls' school, being invited to the cathedral on the anniversary of the, I think it was the 25th, 20th or 25th anniversary of the ordination of women. And so I was there with some young woman who in their entire lifetime had not the, the thought that you couldn't have a woman as a priest. Uh, it just, it never occurred to them. Um, but that, that was a significant shift, in, certainly within the Anglican Church. Uh, and it's, it's a shift that is still taking place. You know, not all Anglican churches will, to, to this day, will, will ordain women. Um, and so it continues to be a concern for feminist theologians that there is a structure that disadvantages women because of their biology. And that is unjust. 
and they would suggest that if it's unjust, it's unequal, and God is on their side. Um, I don't know if they would use language that quite like that. That was pretty messy language, but you get what I'm saying. Um, the other thing that kind of goes with that is uh, it's important to understand the contributions of women. So that's contributions biblically, but also contributions historically, uh, and feminist theologians will will work on highlighting deliberately the work of other women historically. So some of the uh, women who were uh, mystics and those sorts of things, and the the ayahs, the, the the desert mothers. And so the act of highlighting the, their writings and their thought and their impact is part of the broader uh, remit of feminist theology. That's really important stuff. Um, and there's a... Feminist theologians believe that God does not discriminate on the basis of biologically determined characteristics like sex and race, that all create, created, that, but created all humans uh, equally. Um, and so for them, uh, yeah, things that kind of flow out of that are, are as I said, ordination of women. Um, and it's still... It's still a, an issue, you know, um, and it'll take many, many, many years to, to work its way through. Let's not pretend that it's a, you know, tick the box and it's done. It's, it's going to take time. Um, and as I say, not just in the Anglican Church, but, you know, continuing in various leadership roles in all Christian churches. Uh, it's about having equality when it comes to things like reproductive rights, uh, those sorts of things. And also being aware that since much of many of the biblical translations are uh, Hebrew and Greek or gendered languages, and when you gender pronoun, when you gender th um, things that are kind of has an impact on how we think about things. And so for feminist theologians, there'll be a question about how you translate, because translating makes an impact on people. So it's 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 a significant sort of area of work. I came across a a little cartoon um, on that uh, uh, was part of on, on one of the the archives for the movement of ordination for women, and it, it references. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, sort of four previous. And there, it's two, two ladies having a cup of tea, which is very Church of England, very Anglican, a cup of tea. Uh, I imagine there's a scone in the background. And one says, oh, I hear the new Archbishop is completely different to Dr. Runcie. Four Archbishops back. And the other lady sitting there with a the cup of tea goes, oh, good. What's her name? And you, you see the first lady, just very grumpy, angry face. Um, but the fact is that we have not yet had a woman as uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, uh, you know, th this is a very real concern. And so it's going to take time for these things to work their way through. I believe that in the fullness of time, it will. Uh, but at the same time, you can't just say, well, in the end, it'll be okay, and not do anything about it. I, which is why I would suggest that we need to continue to, to advance some of these uh, ideas in in the church, in general. I'm not so much myself, uh, although I'm getting more. I, I'm not really, my, my passion isn't the social justice stuff, although I'm getting more so, getting more so. I'm turning into a grumpy old man who just doesn't understand why people can't be nice and treat each other with fairness. And anyway, so <laughs> I actually really enjoy the next section. And I want to talk a little bit about hermeneutics, which is a very, uh, it's a word that kind of feels very technical. And hermeneutics is the, the study of how you read the Bible. So um, it, it looks at things like, what are the assumptions you bring? What are you looking for? What sorts of stories do you privilege? What are you doing with it afterwards? How do you let it impact on you? 
Uh, and so there's this idea of the hermeneutical cycle where you kind of, you read and you study and you pull apart and you explore and you use that to inform your picture of the whole. And then you kind of cycle back around and you read the parts. And, and so you, you, you cycle through this, looking at the components to understand the whole, the whole illuminates the components and you cycle back around. Ideally, every time you cycle round, what you do is you actually increase in your basic knowledge and understanding. So the first time through, you might read it at, um, think of it as the first floor of a building, and you read the story and of, um, I don't know, uh, we'll, we'll reference it later. So you read the story of a woman who's searching for a coin, and you go, okay, well, that's interesting. It's a story about a woman searching for a coin, um, and it's obviously got something to do with looking and money and things are being valued. Uh, and you kind of, you go around and you look at it in its context and those sorts of things. And then you circle back around and you, you, you having looked at it, you learn more. Um, in the little graphic there, I, I've got a range of different uh, alternatives to the hermeneutical cycle. So there's the hermeneutical Catherine wheel, which uh, is essentially you go around the hermeneutical cycle and then you get distracted by, oh, look, a squirrel. Um, it's, it's hermeneutics for people with ADHD. Uh, it's, <laughs> it is very, it can be very easy to get distracted sometimes because as with any discipline, sometimes there are things that are distracting. Uh, there's the hermeneutical turntable or the hermeneutical vortex where the more you read, the more complicated and confusing it gets. And you just slowly descend into a spiral of, I thought I knew stuff. And then I didn't. Um, speaking of uh, women who are theologians, probably my favorite example of that just about falling into a pit of I have no idea is the story of the Good Samaritan. And it's uh, A.J. Levine, who I'm going to reference later. And she explores some of the parables of Jesus. And she points out that one of the stories, the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, we're often told there's this interpretation that um, the reason the priest and the Levite didn't stop is because they were worried about uh, touching a dead person that would be unclean. I think I've referenced this before, but it was just, it's such an astounding moment for me. And as she points out, that interpretation was a part of Nazi anti-Jewish propaganda. So... I went into a bit of a spiral of, I have no idea what's going on anymore, and I don't know what I can trust. Um, but a fascinating moment. You come out of it with a kind of a more gentle approach to, to what you think you know. Um, there's the hermeneutical roundabout, uh, and, there, and the suggestion is give way uh, to the left. Um, and... It's kind of a Marxist thing, but it's also a recognition that quite often, um, as liberation theologians in general will tell you, uh, Jesus had a preference for the poor and probably wouldn't have been happy with uh, certainly the excesses of modern capitalist structures. Um, you know, remember the story of Jesus in the temple and how he approached that. Uh, so there's that. And then there's the, the hermeneutical mini roundabout, which is... Unfortunately, what happens with a lot of people, uh, it's just the assumption that my reading is right. I'm not going to take anything else on board. Uh, I suspect feminist the uh, theologians would at least want us to, to uh, at the very least, challenge that. Okay. So some of the things that have come out of uh, feminist theology is things like an awareness of how often we use gendered language for God, uh, how often we use gendered translations uh, of scripture, those sorts of things. And that's led to people imaging God in various different ways, and including imaging Christ as a woman. Now, from an historical perspective, there'd be very few people, very few, I can't think of any, who would make the serious argument that Jesus was a woman. Rather, what they're saying is that in many respects, the role Jesus had in society is an equivalent role to the one that women have held in society in other places. Um, you know, his body was used for others, for other people's 
benefit. He was uh, very low in the political structure and he was used for others' political ends. And all of that uh, speaks to, to many women's perspectives. Um, I think there are still what's there are still more men called David or John on sort of uh, as CEOs of major companies in Australia than there are women. Uh, so that's not a good sign. Um, so so we can see that this is still a major factor. So hermeneutics has to do with the lens to a certain extent. What's the lens you bring. And generally, uh, feminist hermeneutes, uh, feminist theologians will bring three dominant lenses. Uh, and the first is the first one I learned about a number of years ago. Uh, and it was, I think it was proposed, in fact, by uh, Schuster Fiorenza, uh, or perhaps Phyllis Tribble. Um, I've got a link on the notes if you want to go and have a look in, in the bottom there. It, it, it correctly attributes it. Uh, I've forgotten. Um, and so the, the hermeneutic of suspicion is, it's about not just taking at face value what's in the text, but being a little suspicious of it. Being a little suspicious of it because you know that historically it was in all likelihood written by men. It was written in a culture and a milieu in which men were the dominant part of society. It was written uh, responding to men's primary concerns. So one of the things that feminist theologians have pointed out is that given it's very uh, male-centered, male-dominated patriarchal background, uh, scripture is actually remarkably full with women's voices. Uh, and they say, and, and for many of them, they'd say, that is not an accident. That is, in fact, the work of God, making sure, uh, in a sense, that women's voices are still there. Um, but they also acknowledge that we have to do some work to go looking for them uh, and to be a little suspicious. So um, this conversation actually came out of uh, the conversation about Jephthah's daughter. And I was asked to do, do a little bit more on, on feminist theology. And in that context, uh, there's this awareness that Jephthah's daughter, who is sacrificed, is not named. She's not, she's not given a humanity. She is turned into an object um, in a way that is, that is, by the text, as well as by the society out of which the text comes. So um, that's what this hermeneutic of suspicion does. It's a, it's a lens of just reading carefully, looking for women's voices, looking for women's stories, um, looking for where perhaps they have been suppressed and seeing if you can undo some of that suppression. Uh, it's, it's finding the sacred in those stories. Uh, and it's been a very powerful tool it's highlighted many things that people hadn't necessarily picked up on previously. Uh, so that's the hermeneutic of suspicion. It's the hermeneutic of just, let me read that again, looking for women's voices. Uh, and so the example is, one of the examples, I mean there are many, is in Paul's letter to the people in Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 34, uh, he's, he says women should keep silent in the churches. Now. A lot of people have taken that to be a permanent injunction. Paul is saying for all times and in all contexts, women should be silent in churches. Feminist theologians who are coming with the hermeneutic of suspicion are saying, Paul's writing to the people in Rome. He's writing at the very start of the church's history in a very male-dominated society. Perhaps what he's trying to do is he's trying to help uh, the church grow, and he knows that in that particular instance, having the church being dominated by the voice of women will make it, for whatever reason, so unpalatable to the surrounding community that they won't be able to hear it. So it has a, a missiological and pastoral imperative. 
And so a feminist theologian would say, what's the current form of the missiological, the missional, and pastoral, the caring imperative? Well, the current version would say, in our current society, having an organization that explicitly prohibits women from preaching is deeply inappropriate. And you would think, why would a person, why would half the population listen to someone from an organization that explicitly prohibits it? That would be very against the, miss, the missional nature. It's also deeply unpastoral because it tells people that their voices are, as I say, half the population, that their voices are unable to be heard, that their voice is structurally invalid that their gender prohibits them from speech. Um, I think our history has enough of that. Anyway, so moving on. So this is the, 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 what's come out of that uh, feminist hermeneutic of suspicion. Uh, there's also been a, a hermeneutic of remembrance. So it's about just being very conscious and deliberate of where women's stories have been told and highlighting them, bringing them to the fore. So, um, you know, thinking once again of, say, the Desert Mothers and sharing their writings, sharing their stories, uh, telling, you know, reimagining their stories in modern times. Um, also, it's about taking things like um, the woman who searches diligently for uh, the, the lost coin and going, well, that's a story that talks to feminist theologians about their work. Uh, in scripture and searching diligently for the sacred coin of women's stories in scripture. Um, A.J. Levine also points out that in that story, which is sandwiched between or packaged with uh, the story of the lost sheep and the story of the lost son, in the story of the lost sheep, we're very happy to say, oh, the shepherd uh, represents God. And in the story of the lost son, the, sometimes called the prodigal son, we say, oh, the father represents God. But many people would have a moment's pause to say, oh, the woman represents God. And so uh, feminist theologians would ask, why? They would say, do you honestly believe that God is gendered masculine and therefore a shepherd or a father is a more appropriate metaphor, but that you can't use? I mean, we use metaphors of rocks and mountains and eagles why are people so reticent to to um accept that the woman who's searching could also could is equally likely to be a metaphor for god and so this is part of that kind of the hermeneutic of suspicion and the hermeneutic of uh remembrance being highlighted and talking about how we then perhaps uh might uh just read scripture more deeply in fact but recognizing that there are many women's voices in there okay so i'm going to go on to the final one this is actually in a sense a fairly new one for me uh but i think i, I like it i like it um so i'm really pleased that i came across this um and it's the the hermeneutic of pro proclamation often in my experience people ask the question What's the point of sort of things like philosophy or theology? It's all stuff done by academics. It's all there to confuse you. It's all there to just, you know, it has no real value. It has no hands-on uh, practical impact. Now, uh, I, think, I think when we look at this um, and we look at the fact that, you know, um, women are now ordained in the in churches and um, there are people in the congregate in my congregation who will say things like oh i can remember when i was a little girl i wanted to be a server but i couldn't be because only boys were allowed to be servers we wouldn't have that conversation anymore it just wouldn't happen um so uh I, we, we're starting to see how this academic work kind of filters its way through and has an impact on the day-to-day -day lived experience Having said that, we can't just rely on osmosis. We can't just rely on this kind of weird trickle-down uh, movement of ideas. 
it's important that uh, in feminist theology that part of what you do is to take those stories and highlight them, to proclaim them in whatever way is appropriate. So that might be things like um, doing artworks uh, with God or Christ depicted as a woman. It might be about, um, you know, putting together liturgical dances, if your community does dances, where women play the role of God, um, or, or those sorts of things. I, I mean, liturgical dance is not something I'm a big fan, I'm a big participant in. Uh, but, you know, in whatever way that the gospel is proclaimed, wherever you are, the idea in the hermeneutic of proclamation is that part of what's proclaimed in that context is those women's voices. Uh, so, so that's the idea, that it's about finding the, the, the voices of women, finding the stories of women, um, peeling back the layers of the patriarchy and presenting them as sacred scripture to the world that we might then respond to them. I hope that gives you a little insight into feminist theology. Um, if you have any questions uh, or comments, now would be the time to throw them up. I'm just going to check and see if over here, if this has any... Uh, I don't think so. Um, so, I don't have any questions. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, oh, so we've had a few people saying very interested, uh, very interesting, sorry. Uh, great you were able to join us. Um, yes, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are often seen as being feminine or being feminine attributes. Uh, interestingly, uh, for a lot of people, the Spirit would be the, um, the feminine attribute of God. So in Hebrew, the word for Spirit is gendered uh, feminine. Now, um, in Greek, it's not. In fact, if I recall correctly, in Greek, it's gendered masculine. So when you translate uh, from Hebrew into Greek, uh, you, you uh, lose the feminine gendering. And then when, we, when it's been translated into English, spirit isn't necessarily gendered at all. Uh, but it's worth remembering that the spirit of God is, is a feminine image, uh, at least a feminine word, whether it's, then, yeah, so that's hopefully interesting. Um, yeah, people have spoken there about God as a nurturer, female. Uh, yes, um, there's a song by Amy Grant called El Shaddai, um, and El Shaddai is, in, is one of the titles for God. Uh, and it's usually translated as God of the Mountains. But it's a feminine term. And uh, another way of translating it would be God of mountainous bounty or generous providence. Uh, or, 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 God who or God who provides, she, feminine term, she who provides a bounty to all. Um, yeah. So um, hopefully that was interesting for you. Uh, I think that's it in terms of questions. Uh, it was great that people were able to log on. I'm going to say go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.